SoFlo Church. It is so good to be with you today. And uh, as Jamie said, I, I am a Chiefs fan, and because I live in Vegas, I actually got to go to the Super Bowl last week, and uh, somebody gave us tickets. They actually came from Visa. Visa gave us tickets and, and uh, came with it. it. They also gave us a $400 gift card to go. So not only did I go to the Super Bowl for free, they actually paid me to be there. They wanted me there so bad. And, uh, but it was exhausting for Chiefs fans. I mean, you know, we were behind the entire game. So it was just exhausting. But let me just say, I, I love your church and I love your pastor. I have watched this church since day one. The Crossing has uh, been one of the supporting churches behind SoFlo. And so I'm just excited just to be here and to see all of this and what God is doing here. And I love your pastor. Um, you may not know this because I think a lot of times when we're in these settings, we, we just don't know. But Jamie is one of the most respected pastors and leaders in the country. Jamie and Alex have been dear friends of my wife and I. We watched their faithfulness for years as he was a pastor in Kentucky and then were part of their vision to reach South Florida. And so it's just an honor for me to be here and, and uh, to be part of what God is doing here at SoFlo. So just to answer a few questions. Um, yes, there's churches in Vegas. No, I don't live next to the MGM. And no, Elvis is not one of our elders. Um, God has been doing amazing things in Las Vegas about people finding Jesus, amazing things at the crossing. And so if you're ever in Vegas on a Sunday, we would love to host you. We'd love to have you be a part of, of what's going on there. But this is week three of, of this series that that uh, we're calling Not By Sight. And what we're doing in this series is we are taking an up-close look at what faith looks like in a believer's life. And um, we've talked about Abraham, we've talked about Gideon, and this week we are taking a look at Daniel. Now, when you look at the Bible, there's a lot of examples of people who imploded their lives, people who made mistakes, people who ran from God. And I think it's so helpful because we serve a God of second chances. We serve a God of redemption. But Daniel, Daniel stays faithful to God his entire life. He never has a scandal. He never has an accusation made against him. He never has an ethical or a moral failure. Daniel lived for God in a way that was different and distinct within a godless and hostile culture. I don't know if you're ever at a place where you feel out of place. Years ago, we had some friends who flew Darla and I to Paris so I could perform their wedding. Now, I'm talking about Paris, France, not Paris, Las Vegas. And it was a tough job, but somebody had to do it. You know what I mean? It was just a, you know, okay, I'll fly to Paris. Yeah, I'll go do this wedding for you. The only problem is the kind of people who can afford to attend a wedding in Paris are the same kind of people who can afford to stay at a five-star hotel and pay for all the luxuries. And Darla and I were not those kind of people. So we were kind of stressed out. One of the events was a dinner cruise on a private yacht on the Seine River. Now, the Seine River, if you don't know what this is, it's a river that goes around Paris. It goes right by the Eiffel Tower. And so we were stressed about this dinner cruise. And so we went out and bought the most expensive clothes that we could afford. Well, come to find out, our outfits from Gap weren't quite as nice as the Versace clothes that these people were wearing. I mean, their shoes cost more than my car. And it ended up just being this huge relief for us because there was nothing we could do to fit in. It just it wasn't gonna happen. So it just took the pressure off. We could just be ourselves. I think that's often how it feels in our culture these days. We don't know quite how to fit in that our culture is shifting so fast and you may feel out of place and you're not sure what to do. And what we're gonna learn from the life of Daniel today is how to stand when culture shifts. It's how to stand when culture shifts. And so I'm gonna begin at the very beginning of the book of Daniel, beginning in verse one, and here's what it says. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, 
Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, Jehoiakim is the 19th king after King David. So you might remember a little bit about, about Israel's history. You got King Saul and then King David. Well, he's the 19th king, Jehoiakim, and he's this really, really bad king. And Babylon was the most dominant superpower of its day. And King Nebuchadnezzar was super powerful and super bad. And here's what they would do is Babylon would go into the surrounding nations and besiege them, which is different than destroying them. To besiege them means that they would take the best of their resources, the best of their arts, the best of their ideas, the best of their people, and absorb them into their culture. And so Babylon was this cosmopolitan city, probably about 150 to 200,000 people who were living there. Verse two says this, it says, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim. Now, let me just stop right here. Because this is so important for us to understand that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't take anything away from God. God is not on the sidelines going, oh, what am I going to do now? You know, what, what's going on here? God allowed him to take it. And you need to realize that because God is still in control. But God's discipline is thorough. That God had warned the children of Israel, as long as they obeyed God and walked in his ways, that God would bless them and protect them. But if they disobeyed and rebelled God, that he would remove his hand of blessing and protection. So in 605 BC, God allowed the Babylonians to invade Jerusalem. Let me go back and read this verse. It says, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim king of Judah, into the hand, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put them in the treasure house of his God. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had this treasure house and he would take all of the other gods of the nations that he conquered and he would put them into his palace. It was like his trophy room. I mean, this is like for, as a Kansas City Chiefs fan, we have a trophy room of all of our Super Bowl trophies. I mean, this is what he would do with these other gods. And every now and then, He would pull these statues out, these gods from all these other countries, and he would put them around his banquet room. And they would celebrate that their god, which was called Marduk, was more powerful than the other gods. Well, the only problem is when they invaded Israel, the Jews didn't have any false idols. You remember the Ten Commandments? One of the Ten Commandments is you shall not make an idol of any kind. So They just went into the temple and they took whatever they could find. So they take the plates and the silverware and the cups and they bring these into his treasure house. Going on here in verse three, it says, then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language. In other words, we want you to speak like we speak, teach them the language and the literature. We want you to think like we think, the literature of the Babylonians. And the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine. So not only do we want you to speak like we speak and to think like we think, we want you to eat what we eat. These were all assigned from the king's table. And they were to be trained for three years. And after that, they went into the king's service. So this is a three-year school. And it's intentionally, it was created to indoctrinate and brainwash these young boys into Babylonian culture. I just believe this is Satan's tactic today to lie and deceive you, to think as he thinks, to behave like he behaves, and to get us to change what we believe. Most Bible scholars believe that Daniel was between 13 and 15 years old at this time. It's amazing to me. They pull him out of his family unit. They remove him from his godly culture and they force them to walk 700 miles 
to Babylon, which is in modern-day Iraq. They take these four guys, so it's not just Daniel. We'll also learn about three other guys by the name of of, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They take these four guys, and they put them into Babylonian school, and the purpose of the school is not to educate them about Babylon. It's to make them Babylonians. They were to remove and erase anything from their godly heritage, their godly upbringing, and to instill the Babylonian values, ideas, beliefs, and systems. And not only are they going to do that, they're going to change their names. Look what it says. It says, among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. Now, don't miss what's happening here. So don't miss this. They not only want them to change how they think, the way they act, what they believe, they want to change their identity, who they are. Their Hebrew names, they identify them with the one true God. Their Babylonian names reposition their identity towards Babylonian gods. So, so look at this. In Hebrew, Daniel, his name meant God is my judge. So it located his name into a relationship with God. They changed his name to Belteshazzar, which means treasure of Baal or Marduk. That's the Babylonian God. Hananiah, Hananiah's name means God shows grace. His name was changed to Shadrach, which means under the command of Aku, which is the moon god of Babylon. Mishael, his name meant there is no one like God. They changed his name to Meshach, which means there is none like Aku, the moon god. And then Azariah, his name meant God is my helper. And his name was changed to Abednego, which means servant of Nebo, the Babylonian god of wisdom. Now, something I discovered when when I was doing this research is throughout the entire book, Daniel never refers to himself by his Babylonian name, not one time. And this is so cool. You're going to love Daniel for this. That throughout the book, Daniel consistently spells the Hebrew names correct and consistently misspells the Babylonian names. Uh, This is so awesome to me. So for years, Bible scholars thought that, you know, this was just some kind of error, some kind of mistake as the scribes were copying the Bible passages. Well, in 1947, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, those manuscripts are the oldest that had ever been found, and the Babylonian names were spelled wrong in those as well, which meant Daniel did this on purpose. That you can change our names, but you can't change our beliefs. So let me just pause here for a minute, and let me talk to you about the three strategies of Babylon. Babylon that this three-year Babylonian school was designed to indoctrinate them into Babylonians and remove their distinctiveness as God's people. It's the same strategy that Satan will use for you and me. Here is strategy number one. It is separation. See, this strategy, it is separation and isolation. They get Daniel and his friends 700 miles away from home. They separate them from their godly culture that they grew up in. They separate them from their godly family and friends that grounded them. And the first step is re-education. The first step of re-education is to destroy the family unit and remove them from godly community. See, if Satan can isolate you from your family and isolate you from godly friends, it is the first step to infiltrate your faith that you walk like the people you walk with. I mean, isn't it true that the dumbest decisions that you've ever made, you did with the dumbest people you ever hung out with? I mean, isn't that true? I mean, I think that's true for all of us. That's why here at SoFlo, and same as at the crossing, is SoFlo circles, small groups are a big deal. 
It's to have other people that you're in community with. That's why SoFlo Kids and SoFlo Students is a big, big deal. Because Daniel, just like Daniel, 13, 14, 15 years old, that he has other people to hang out with. It is, it's a game changer that if you're a student or if you have kids, that you have people that you can do life with who have the same values as you. It's a big deal. Strategy number one is separation. Strategy number two is identification, to change your identity. They, they give Daniel and his friends new haircuts, new customs, new clothes, and new names, all in an attempt to change their identity. The name that they give to Daniel is a female name. Daniel was under the chief eunuch. It is very likely that they forced Daniel to become a eunuch to remove the distinctiveness of his gender. See, it's all part of Satan's strategy to get you to question your identity, who you are. See, that's why he will whisper to you, you are inadequate. You don't belong. You're unloved. You are not good enough. It is all part of the strategy to change your identification. See, the the strategy, it's separation, identification. Strategy number three is indoctrination. This three-year Babylonian school was all about indoctrination. See, when we come here, that we learn doctrine from God's word. That's why, that's why you learn the Bible here. That's why the Bible is taught here. That is to instill God's doctrine and God's teaching into your life. The Babylonian strategy was to teach them their language, their literature, their ideas, all in an attempt to change their beliefs day after day, month after month, for three years. In World War II, the chief minister of propaganda for the Nazi regime was a guy by the name of Joseph Goebbels. And here was his axiom, repeat a lie often enough and it will become the truth. Repeat a lie often enough and it will become the truth. Today, our our culture doesn't drop leaflets from airplanes like they did in World War II. It just uses social media and TikTok and cable news and YouTube, all in an attempt to, to shape our belief away from God's truth. But for Daniel and his friends, they may separate and isolate them from godly culture, They may change their identity from Israelites to Babylonians. They may indoctrinate them with the beliefs and the ways of Babylon, but it does not change who they serve. Look at this next verse. It says, but Daniel, what is this next word? But Daniel what? Resolved. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. He asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. I love this because before the temptation was even in front of him, he predecided what he was going to do and what he was not going to do. And this is a huge learning for us that you predecide in advance, you resolve in your heart that you're going to honor God. That if you tend to drink too much or you're tempted towards drugs. You predecide where you're going to go and who you're going to go with. If you're married, you predecide that you won't have intimate conversations with anyone that's not your spouse. If you're single, you predecide that you're not going to compromise your standards because you're tired of waiting on God to provide the right person. You predecide that you're not going to spend the night at his house after the date or her house after the date. If you're in middle school or high school, you predecide the kind of friends that are going to be in your life and what kind of friends won't be in your life. If you're a football fan, you predecide not to root for the Cowboys. It just never goes good. It just never does year after year. Daniel resolved himself not to defile himself with the royal food, and then he asked for permission. Do you you ever go out to lunch or dinner with somebody who always wants to order off a different menu. You know, it's like, it's the menu, and they, they ask if they have the special one. This is Daniel. I mean, this is Daniel right here. Hey, can, can I eat off of a different menu? Verse nine, 
It says, now God had caused the officials to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men? The king would then have my head because of you. And Daniel's like, well, I hear what you're saying. I I hear what you're saying. He says this, he goes, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance to with what you see. Now, uh, this isn't some spiritual keto diet. That, that's not what's happening here. They, they are leaving it to God for the results. They resolve to obey God and they leave the outcomes up to him. So let me just read these next few verses that kind of finish this story right here. It says, so he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. I don't know if they were happy about it. These other ones are like, hey, we kind of want the king's food. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. That must have been quite a day. Then the king king talked with them and found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them. He found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. Here's what I want you to see. That the minute that Daniel decided who he was gonna be, the minute that Daniel drew a line in the sand is when God went to work. I mean, you've got this guy, King Nebuchadnezzar, who does not believe the same things that Daniel and his buddies believe. He does not submit his life to the same God that they've submitted to, and he does not share the same values or his convictions, and yet he is so impressed with them that he saw their wisdom and understanding and invites them to have a platform of influence, not only in the Babylonian culture, but in his life as well. So I want to share just three quick learnings for when culture shifts. For when culture shifts, here's number one. We must know who we are. We must know who we are. This is your identity. If you don't know who you are, and if you don't know who you belong, then you will drift in whatever direction that culture is blowing. Your identity is not determined by what you do, what you have, what you wear, It's not determined by your past. It's not determined by who you desire. If you are a follower of Jesus, your identity is in Christ. Your identity is secure in him. And only he gets to tell you who you are. Learning number one. Second, when culture shifts, we must know what we believe. We must know what we believe. You don't decide what you believe when you're in the fire. You pre-decide what you believe. You resolve ahead of time what is your line in the sand. See, if we are only discipled by social media and cable news, then we're gonna start to believe what they say. But if you are discipled by the word of God, then our beliefs are shaped by what God says. That we must know who we are. We must know what we believe. Here's learning number three you must know where to put your trust. Daniel didn't put his trust in Nebuchadnezzar. He put his trust in God and God alone. One of my good friends, he has the Bible reference, Daniel 3.18, that's tattooed right on his arm. And part of his story is he and his wife have been infertile for 20 years, that they desperately wanted to have children. And it just did not happen for them. 
And it has been excruciating. It's been this journey that, that they have walked through. But Daniel 3.18 is later on in the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in the fiery furnace. And what they say to King Nebuchadnezzar, they say the God that we serve is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your gods. See, that is trust. And so for my friends, this has just become their verse. Both of them have it tattooed to their arms. That God is able to do this for us. But even if he chooses not to, we're still gonna serve him. That God has the power to do whatever I want to change in my life, but even if he doesn't, I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna be blown around with our culture. See, that is trust that my God is able to deliver me no matter what I face. But even if he chooses not to, I will trust him. So to which of these do you need to make a new commitment to in your life? To be reminded of, of who you are in Christ? To be resolved in what you believe? or to trust no matter the outcome. Which of these three, if for you, is God going, this is you, this is what you needed to hear today, to be reminded of who you are in Christ, to be resolved, this is what I believe and I will not cross that line, or to trust no matter the outcome. The Apostle Paul, he encourages us with these words. He says, therefore, Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to, um, to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. See, we've got to remember who the real enemy is. The real enemy is not culture. The real enemy is not the talking heads on TV or TikTok. The enemy is not someone who has a different belief system or political view than you. The real enemy is the principality and the powers of this dark world. So what's our response? Stand. We stand. See, there, there's three categories of people in the book of Daniel. You've got the people of God. You have the people of Babylon. And then you have the people of God who begin living Babylonian. So what's our response? we submit to the lordship of Jesus and we stand in our faith. And so here, here's what I wanna challenge you because I believe that some of you are not followers of Jesus yet and you have a reason. You have a story. And if we heard your story, we'd go, I get it. I get it why you have never surrendered your life to him. But I just wonder if today is the day where you will finally surrender your life to Jesus and go, I, I don't understand it all, but I'm gonna trust. I'm gonna place my trust in Jesus. Maybe for some of you, you're a follower of Jesus, that you've made Jesus your savior, but you've never made him your Lord. That there's a part of your life that's not been brought under the lordship of Jesus. That it's like all of these parts have been brought under the Lordship of Jesus, but maybe there is this one part, you, you've justified it, you've struggled with it, and maybe God's just saying, okay, it's time for you to surrender that as well. I, I think this is one of the reasons why God talks so much about money. You wanna know what I think is the number one thing that stands in the way of our heart? It's our money. That's why Jesus talked about it more than heaven, more than hell, more than faith, that Jesus talked about our money. Because for some of us, that is the last area of surrender to Jesus. And I'm just telling you me personally, this is me personally, I grew up in a Christian home, and so I grew up as a kid that we would get allowance. And then my dad just taught, he said, so we give the first back to God. And so if I got 50 cents, he'd pay me in nickels. 
so then I could just take the first back to God. And this has been the practice of my life, my entire life, my entire marriage, is the first has always gone back to God. And I'm just telling you, I have seen God show up in my life in amazing ways. And maybe there is an area of your life, whatever it is, that just needs to be surrendered to him. And so I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna pray for you. But here's what I wanna challenge you to do is that you just pray yourself, that you submit whatever it is. Maybe it's to surrender your life to Jesus today. To say, I'm in. I don't have it all figured out, but I'm in. The next step is baptism. It's to identify with Jesus. It, it represents the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. Maybe it is an area of your life where you're going, okay, God, this is scary for me, but I'm giving this to you. Let's just pray together. God, we thank you for being a God who sees exactly what we're going through. And you never leave us. You never forsake us. God, I just pray and that for those who maybe have never surrendered their life to Jesus, that today would be the day that they would say, okay, I'm in. I'm giving my life to Jesus. For others who are followers of Jesus, but there is an issue in their life that has not been fully surrendered. God, would you just meet them right where they are today? God, would you give them the strength to make whatever step of obedience that you are calling them to do. And so we pray this all in the name.